Earlier in this course, we covered two ways to initialize our repositories. Now let's do it. We can create the local repository first. Recall that the local repository for a project is stored in the working folder for that project in a folder named .get. The repository contains every commit we've made to that project. Then we publish the local repository to GitHub, creating the remote repository for the project. The remote repository contains a copy of every project commit. Alternatively, we can create the remote repository for the project first, then clone that repository to the project's working folder, creating our local repository. Since we've just created our GitHub account, let's create the remote repository first. Let's use GitHub and create a remote repository for our recipes website. We start by navigating to www.github.com. If you have a new GitHub account, you'll see a page to help you get started. Click Create Repository here to create your first repository. If you've already been using GitHub, when you navigate to the site, you'll see your personal dashboard. Here's mine. I've blurred some of the content on the right since it contains other people's GitHub information. Click the New button here to create a new repository. In either case, we'll see the Create a New Repository page. The first thing it wants is the repository name. A repository name should be short but descriptive of your project. It must be unique within your GitHub account. GitHub checks that for you. We'll call it Recipes. And we are good. General conventions for repository names suggest that we use lowercase. And if we have multiple words, use dashes between the words, such as recipe-book. We can optionally provide a description. Next, we have the option of creating a public or private repository. If we create a public repository, anyone on the Internet can see it but only collaborators that we pick can commit to it, so we don't have to worry about strangers changing our files. If we create a private repository, it's private except for our chosen collaborators. We may want to make our repos public and share our code with others, unless our code is proprietary. Scrolling down, we then have the option to create a readme file a README file gives those looking at a repository an idea of what that repository is for and instructions for using it. We'll check the box to add a README file. A .getIgnore template helps you identify which files in your folder you do not want to include in Git's version tracking. For an application, you don't want to include intermediate build files, for example, as they are often large and can easily be rebuilt from source files. For our simple website, we don't need a .getignore template. Choose a license as next. A license lets other developers know what they can do with the code in our repo. GitHub provides a website to help you make your decision. Click Learn More to go to the GitHub documentation. Feel free to read this at your leisure. When you are ready, click chooseolicense.com for help in selecting which license makes sense for your project. This site provides criteria to help you decide which type of license to select. For our recipe website, we'll make the license simple and permissive and pick an MIT license. Closing the tab and going back to GitHub, we'll select MIT license from the list. Here, GitHub shows us the name it picked for our default branch. We can change the default name in our settings, but main is a good choice. Before continuing, we can double-check the action we are about to perform and click Create Repository. It creates the repo as we've requested. Select. It lists the license and readme files it created for us. And here it displays the content of that readme file. GitHub automatically performed our first commit. That commit is a snapshot of the two files we told it to add to the repository, our license file and README. Click on the commit message, and we see the details of that first commit. Here's the person that made the commit, 
and the time of the commit. Over here is the hash, which is the unique identifier get generated from the commit. It's a long string of letters and numbers. And here is the list of changed files. Click on a file to see what was changed. The plus signs indicate that new lines were added. GitHub added these lines for us. Scrolling up, to go back to the repository homepage, click the repository name here. Now that we have a remote repository here in GitHub, we want to get these files to our local machine so we can work on the project. Using the Code button, we see several options. We can use the Get command line with this URL to clone the repository. That initializes the local repository and copies the commit history. There is a desktop application for GitHub, appropriately called GitHub Desktop. We can use the desktop application to clone the repository, work with our files locally, and push our commit history to GitHub. More on GitHub Desktop in a moment. Or we can download the code as a zip file. That's an easy way to get the code if we don't care about repositories. For example, if we just want to look at another developer's project. If we are working with someone else's repository, we want to fork it first. The fork option is here. Forking a repository creates a copy of that repository under our GitHub username. We then clone that forked repository to initialize our local repository. We want to open with GitHub Desktop, but we need to install GitHub Desktop first. Before we do that, let's go back to the slides. So, we can use GitHub to create a remote repository, or we can create a GitHub repository with other tools that we'll look at shortly. Any public repository you create on GitHub is accessible to everyone, but no one can modify your repository without your approval. And you can access anyone's public GitHub repository, but you can't change it without their approval. Now let's get started with GitHub Desktop.